would like to show we will be looking at is improving supply chain safety and security through joint initiatives with three KLs. So I think that's a topic that's very near and dear to the hearts of many of us. Um, and to start the conversation, I first like to invite my panel members up. On stage, Mr. Joe Novado, who we just heard from, Mr. Daniel Xavier, and Mr. Saad Shikbal. Decade or so, we're looking at um, how do you protect against terrorism, etc. etc. 
which is very wide ranging topic, safety and security. So what I'd like to do is open it up to the floor um, for any of you to actually direct questions to the panel on one of these two areas, so that we can really narrow it down a bit. Any like this? Okay. Well, we need to get the ball rolling then. Um, so since you mentioned Vision Zero, uh, just uh, and how it's very important to Linfox. I also understand um, Linfox is looking at some rather interesting, groundbreaking intrap technology in Thailand, which is fairly you know, get the industry curve. Why are you doing this? Um, what's what's the outlook look? What's the outlook like? And, Sure. No, there's a number of things we're looking at within the business generally, but yes, we had it from Thailand. Um, before I talk about that, um, in Thailand and also in Malaysia, we have uh, our own regional control rooms. So these are rooms where we monitor all our trucks and all our subcontractor trucks. And in the past, this was very much about where is the truck, is it almost arrived at the customer, has it delivered me met, is the truck on the way back. But now what we're actually using the control rooms now are for safety and security reasons as well. So from a, a security perspective, uh, especially in Thailand, because we have such a large fleet, uh, we monitor fuel thefts uh, and fuel consumption in the trucks through our control room. So we have monitors on our fuel tanks that can show whether the fuel has gone down quickly or not. Um, and if the fuel has gone down quickly, we can pinpoint where that truck is, whether that truck is on the right route, whether he's gone off his fuel fence, and um, we can even pinpoint into where the truck is parked and whether that's a a well-known theft area, shall we say. Uh, and then we can also, when the driver comes back, we can also uh, review the driver and find out you know, how we can manage that theft going forward. Uh, additionally, on the trucks, we also have um, uh, um, door sensors as well, so we can um, um, lock the doors as well, um, manually from the control room, and obviously standardize the mobilizers for the trucks as well. So, you know, in terms of, uh, and this is a standard package we give to all our clients uh, in Thailand and within the business, because that's a key element in time, because fuel theft is a big issue uh, in Thailand. Uh, in Malaysia, what we're looking more at is, um, the, especially with our customers here, when they, you know, in terms of technology requirements, and the, the question is about partnership and the partnership with your clients. So, for, you know, Lindy, you know, uh, for ta uh, fatigue management is really important, so we have in cap cameras to check the drivers to see you know, how they're driving, whether they're driving safely. Um, we have reversing cameras in all our trucks because we knew that a lot of our incidents were, were reversing based. So we put rever uh, reversing cameras or, uh, into the trucks and the reversing incidents went then to zero. You know, so for me, cause and effect like that is really you know, critical. Um, but yeah, you know, in, in Thailand and Malaysia, you know, we've got a lot of investment into not the standard-based trucks. We bring in trucks in line with what the client wants, or we in line with what the environment requires. Thanks for that. Um, so on the topic of safety, maybe Joe, um, the root cause issues, the root cause management of safety issues, um, in your experience, you know, what, what do you see as a real cause? and solution? To be very honest, safety has been a byproduct of a policy of HR and has not been well embraced with the organization. However, it's something that you can't run away anymore because safety has a number of connotations to the, 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 the continuity and smooth operation of, um, of, uh, of, of business. Now, how do you inculcate this culture? Clearly there's an ISO, I can't remember the ISO, is it 28,000 or something? Uh, and there's the OSHAS uh, European standard. I think people need to start to embrace what those certifications are about. And that will start the education course. But too often people think safety, oh, gloves, shoes, this and that. But there's a lot more um, that has to be addressed. No, 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 see it, you know, that to, if you permit me, you know, to add on something that you said about child racing earlier, the truck, the, the question that you threw the truck, actually. Uh, if, uh, if you look at the child racing aspect of uh, security management, you know, child racing, child racing attack has revolutionized, re revolutionized training. International training is no more the uh, 
supply chain movement of goods cheaply and quickly, there's a third dimension to it. It is moving goods quickly and safely. That's where the security aspect comes in, right? Uh, uh, you also have to be, where it, in, in this volatile situation in the world, where terrorism is left, right, and center, when you talk about uh, supply chain security management, you have to anticipate and create contingency plans for the protection of uh, supply chain materials moving, right? Taking into consideration there can be disruptions and vulnerabilities. Now you talk about vulnerabilities or anticipating let me take, you take the what you call uh, example of this, you look in a uh, refugee crisis today. Right. To many kind uh, people, these refugees, they look at the refugee situation with kindness and compassion. But for the security process, the homeland security is a defense scenario altogether. They constantly summary of the law, you can provoke this, going to unleash uh, terror in the European cities. Very sensitive. All right? Now, uh, as, as uh, what you call it, we're see. Ever since the uh, info, infamous 9-11 uh, terrorist attack, security concept has changed a lot, especially in the area of supply chain. Right, when you, now you talk about your supply chain, you have to reinvent security to address supply chain security management. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, I, I, coming from a shipper's point of view, security is not just about uh, some of the, the common areas, but clearly it's about risk. It's about the continuity of the business, continuity of the customer's business. So is is a, is a protecting your brand image and also the cost of failure. Now, when we look at security, apart from the physical that has been described, the trucks, the, 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 from, a, from a shipper point of view, there are two levels of security the physical security and the logic security, the data security. I won't talk about the data because the physical is where you can see, look, see, touch. Now, in, in defining for supply chain, for example, one of the areas of security that, that we introduced many years ago. Uh, was minimalistic labeling and uh, logos on carton boxes. Now some say, ah, oh, but I can't recognize a box, I can't, do. but unfortunately, it's less of an eye catcher. So those could be one way to safeguard uh, pilferage or, or loss. Uh, the other way is to use technology. Uh, RFID, the tagging now has become quite cheap. So from a supply chain point of view, that's the aspect of security from a shipping point of view that we should start, we start looking at. And also how to track um, the, the contents of, uh, of the process. So clearly, in, the, in terms of security, we've got the process, the procedure, the process, and the compliance. And this is where you have a collaboration between your internal operation and your service providers, like uh, uh, Sajid was saying. But in terms of the organization, you have to make sure that the training, the discipline, and the adherence are also strengthened. It's not one having a fantastic service provider with all the gizmos on his truck when your internal process is failing. So from that point of view, that's very fundamental. From the supply chain of your practitioners, you need to go back to your internal process. Don't expect this gentleman or that gentleman or other customer or supplier to, to solve your problem. So my, my advice is you've got to work on a defensive strategy first internally before we then go to the external world. Okay, very safe. So very very interesting job. Thank you very much. But, then let me ask the panel, and maybe also the audience, this. Many people talk about safety and security and the importance of it. Um, and there's a lot being written about it all the time. But in organizations, um, in terms of priorities, you know, if you're the CEO of a multinational that produces some budget, um, how really important is safety and security is it? really a must-have, or you're doing it just because it's a must-do? Yeah, yeah must-have. Um, yeah, must must um, but what's the opinion from the, the floor, maybe, um, in your organization, in your experience? Um, are your organizations really looking at safety and security because that's in their DNA, or is it 
just because it's something that's required. If I can just kick it off first. What um, response to Hi, uh, Nicole Bell from Ericsson. Um, no, in our company, it's, it's uh, an absolute must have and it's a mandatory uh, biannual uh, review at all the employee levels. Around 14,000 people have to do a, a renewed refresher on uh, safety issues, whether or not it impacts their job and say that right to right. So it's everything from computer safety and things like that all the way to physical safety as well. So. It's not a mandatory thing. Okay, um, gentlemen in front here. Um, it's a must have, but I think it takes time to get there. And I always compare it with wearing a safety belt. First, you wear a safety belt because if you don't do it, you get a fine, at least in Europe. Then it becomes a little bit like this one. You put it on as soon as you get in the car, you do it automatically. And the third step is when you sit in the car, you put the belt and you make sure that everybody else has the belt. So it's a must have, but you don't get there overnight. Okay. So what about, um, I just made a comment about the security part. Uh, I think safety is definitely a must have, um, but the security one, probably about 10 years ago it wasn't, it wasn't required, but especially in the last five years, that's, I believe with, you know, uh, expectations from the workforce, you know, one ten more money, um, buying power, um, not so much cash available, I think a lot of the security issues you have are actually in-house. Uh, and can be can be started from in-house sources, uh, from my experience. And you know, for me, that's the reason why not just your trucks and your transportation, but also your warehousing, your whole supply chain needs to be secure as a must-have to you know have that right security team in place that's independent, that's independently audited, and that you're you know auditing your staff. You know, in the past it was yes, the electronics industries, the tobacco industries. You know the drinks industries, which were the high value ones, but now consumers will take anything because anything can be sold on the black market. Can I ask a question? Uh, how many of you have heard of TAPA? T A P A. Well, not so many. Not so many. And for the others, why? Why have you heard of TAPA? Uh, when we source uh, contract logistics or any quick. Part of our requirements. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, because I was quite surprised at how few in the audience actually have heard of TAPA. The TAPA stands for Transport Assets Protection Association. And for those of you who haven't heard of TAPA, I think you should start looking at TAPA because TAPA is a, a good way to introduce security into your company. It starts implanting the processes and methodologies, um, and it, it also touches on safety, but really it's about assets. And so there's, there's, there's uh, TAPA for warehouse infrastructure and TAPA for transportation. And I think starting to embrace that already creates that internal awareness and strength in your, in your supply chain um, and, and maintains that, that sort of uh, <coughs> that, uh, discipline and knowledge that's required. Then to handshake your service provider such a responsibility. So my recommendation for that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Now, so we all see it's important. We all see we look at it. So what about within the same organization? If you look at, say, a multinational doing business in Australia, compared to that same multinational um, doing business here in Malaysia, for example, in Singapore, you'll see that you've got disparate standards um, or enforcement, maybe. Um, would someone like to comment on that? How, how do you deal with that? Or what's your experience mean? I think as a, as a multinational, if you have a footprint in whatever country, the policy was the same, and I think, I think there's no there's no compromise. Today. Any multinational with a network, whether you're a service provider or you're a shipper or you're a supplier, you need to implant consistent methodologies across across the, uh, your organisation, and you've got to do it with, with a certain amount of discipline. Like you know, Stefan was talking about a three-stage approach to putting a seatbelt. Yes, so in some cases you, are, you you are, you 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 may have more time to do it. In other cases you may not have time to do it. Because don't forget. If you're a supplier, many times, and you're supplying serious uh, customers, on many occasions they will be auditing your organization and security and safe passage of, of their goods in your supply chain will be one of the, the highlights of the audit. And if you don't have those key measures in place, and, in, and you may be very strong in one country, we another country, you may be disqualified. 
So again, it's a question of dependability, as someone said earlier on, uh, being dependent, your customer being dependent on your supply chain. And therefore, it's, it's fundamental to business. It can destroy a business if you don't have that uh, assurity in your supply chain. I, I agree with you in terms of uh, the policies need to be the same, uh, need to have consistency across the country, and the implementation may be different. So, for one of the biggest challenges here in Asia is the behavioural piece, uh, and you know, in terms of the health and safety, you know, most of the major cities here in Asia, you see guys on motorbikes without helmets on. You know, you, you, the one that really annoys me is you see people in cars with a kid in between the, the, the passenger and the driver's seat standing, playing around. You know, those things don't happen in Australia. They don't happen in Europe because the regulations are there, the, the mindset is there. So the change environment or the change program in Asia is much harder, but the, I, I totally agree the policy has to be the same. Just jump in there. It, it's, don't, don't take it for granted that Europe or US is more advanced than Asia. It, it's not always the case. I tell you one of the experiences I had when I was implementing TAPA worldwide. I had 22 locations to implement uh, 22 different warehouses. And the first thing that TAPA requires is, is cameras, right? So cameras, closed circuit TV, doors, etc. You know where the biggest problem? In Europe. Because the unions said, no, you can't, put, you can't put your cameras on operators because of violation of human rights. All that nonsense, right, Stefan? Uh, so we well, said, well, cameras are there, you're crazy or what? So we found a way, we put it on doors, on secure areas. And then gradually, they moved around, they stayed quiet. But even cultural breakthroughs are not decided only in Asia. Also in Europe, uh, also in the US, there are certain cultural uh, elements which are a challenge. So it's not just Asia. So I, I think in Asia, in a way, we are more fortunate because it's more dynamic, it's more flexible, more open-minded. Some of the old traditional old legacy countries sometimes are more challenging. So, <laughs> so yeah, good point, Joe. So Daniel, so what are some of the general components? You know, if you're talking about warehouse security management, um, and to Joe's point about implementing it and the challenges you face across different uh, geographies, what are some of the things that you think we should look at or consider um, in order to make this as smooth as possible? Yeah, actually, the basic uh, components of the security program uh, for an organization of a warehouse actually is uh, the core concept of yes, you need to have procedural security. And if the procedural security, the, there's requirement for policy, there's requirement of procedure, there's, as you said earlier, there's, there's, and these components to be effective need to be complied with. For the uh, employees to comply with these uh, procedures, you need to have to educate them. That is security awareness. Right. Now, coming back to the other aspect, is you need to have uh, physical security, or you call it parameter security, uh, in which you need to have electronic, electronic surveillance. So we're talking about CCTV. Right. When you talk about CCTV, you need to have people monitoring the CCTV. Right. And the, 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 uh, the funniest part about CCTV monitoring is that you can, the CCTV can record uh, crime being committed, but the CCTV cannot run and test the guy is committing the crime. And for that, you need a security person. So it is something that you have to you have incorporate both this into one, so if, if the functionality becomes very productive. Second thing is that you need to have an investigation unit in your organization uh, with the ability to investigate uh, all kind of discrepancies or misconduct that happens in an organization. Uh, I personally believe these are the very fundamental uh, uh, components that you require to have an effective security management in the system. Thank you. Right. Is the panel like to accept the uh, procedures? There was a lot of key points. I think security could be two ways, uh, Daniel, because you can put policies and you can put procedures, but then you've also got to have, and unfortunately, no organization is perfect. Incidents happen all the time, no matter how good your profession, your, your organization will be. One of, the, one of the important things is to have a recovery uh, 
because of this fast. So you go to the stop all organization, go to the investigation, business stops, stop, no move, like you know, CID type of thing, it can be very detrimental as well. So you've got to be able to have a, a, a recovery policy that or recovery process that is not transparent but it's has a continuity throughout the organization. But the thing as well is I, I, I had a lot of I, I'm very pro security. But I had a lot of clashes with our security department because it becomes like a, you know a crisis. Oh, we have a crisis. We got to stop this. We got to stop that. We have counterfeit. Of course, we're counterfeiting all the time in China. You got you got uh, a bit of fridge all the time going on. It's part of life. But if the security department or your internal guys start exaggerating the situation, you end up creating a mess. So again, the security organization, whilst it has to be serious, has to also be pragmatic and not to create a crisis and police come in and, yes, police come in, but we don't continue business. We've got to stay carrying on uh, the day-to-day -day operation, otherwise... Uh, so I, I think, uh, whilst I appreciate your comments, it's going to be tempered with some of the ways of the So this is where you draw the line here. Uh, yeah, uh, may I comment on this? Actually, what you said is very true, but the fact is that in my branch here, with relationship and system, what we do is the factors involving system procedures, you incorporate in the employment contract. Therefore, it becomes mandatory for them to comply with the system of procedures. So you are not going, you are not uh, overstepping your white boundaries, right? And they are required to follow the compliance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I guess I'm joking. You have to be pragmatic and very enjoy that line. Yeah? You don't have to also create like a. Um, you look to over-engineer something, All right? Um, so where do we draw the line? Um, comments from the, yes, the gentleman back there. Where do we draw that line and how do we look at this? Hi, good afternoon. We are from the Fox. Um, first of all, firstly, I'd like to congratulate Joe for saying that not all problems are associated in Asia. It happens in other countries as well, so safety issues, corruption issues is not prevalent only in Asia. So it's a good point. Secondly, uh, MNCs, they do bring along high safety standards and policies, and whether they implement it, uh, same here or in Asia, is uh, is uh, it's questionable at times. Because uh, one very good example, I would say, in driving safety, in this uh, logistics industry comes from the customer or the client. If the customer feels it's part of their DNA, then it trickles down to the subcontractors. And, and I'm very proud to say one good example, because I've worked for this organization before, it's Petronas. It's a Malaysian company. And when I was in Petronas, we were dealing with MNCs, subcontractors MNCs, who did not bring their safety standards of Europe to Asia. They wanted to follow the Asian style of working, which I mean, they feel safety is not important. But Petronas being a Malaysian company said, no, we want you to implement the same thing you have been doing in Asia and in Europe. So, so it again comes to the customer. How strong the customer drives the service provider. Contractually, part of the DNA, part of the culture, Another example for Linfox now, we have Lindley. Lindley has few, subs, few contractors in its panels, but Lindley drives a very high safety standard. So it would be easy for a company like Linfox to comply with that. But for other Malaysian companies, Malaysian contractors, they have to step up. They have to push themselves to meet the safety requirement. So when this trickle down effect happens, then Automatically, everyone benefits from these high safety standards. Primarily, for me, safety is a passion. It's it's not for company based. I always tell the people, don't do it because the company says to do it. Don't drive safely because the company wants to drive safely. Drive safely because you want to go back to your families. You have people on the road. So these are the these are the messages we must drive to within our organization internally and externally that. Safety is not about primarily about company, about policies. It's part of our passion. It's part of our need to ensure that all of us 
come to work safely and go back safely and also on the security part as well. Again, it differs amongst the customers. Some customers have high value goods. So when you go to high value goods, additional security requirements are needed. But if you have low value goods, then lesser security requirements are needed. Again, it's coming back to the customer-driven policies. So where we draw the line is internally what are our values? How we look at safety, that's one. And then externally, what is driving us? What are our customer requirements? So this is where we draw the line, if I could answer the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the audience? Gentlemen at the front here. Great, I can see that. I think the question of where to draw the line when it comes to safety, I, I personally don't draw the line. I think we we have to take a, a more holistic view that something we've had success with in um, here in Malaysia and in Indonesia and down in Singapore is is taking safety outside of the warehouse, taking it outside of business and you know, we get for example people riding motorbikes without helmets, we will have discussions with our team on the importance of riding safely to work because if they're unsafe coming to work then they're not going to work at all. We take our safety teams, we go into people's homes, we will show them where they can be safe, what safety risks there are in their everyday life and use this as a way to to get them seeing safety as more than just something that happens from 9 to 5 in the warehouse, but something that they have to live safely and act safely. And then when they do that as part of their whole life, we find that they become more safety aware, more safety conscious inside the, the normal work environment. Thank you very much. Well, I think we have a comment from the back of the room as well. Good afternoon. My name is Wilfred from Learning Evolution Organization. <coughs> My company, uh, we provide consultancy and training specifically on the dangerous zones regulations, uh, specifically in PG by air. Uh, my clientele includes uh, shippers, freight forwarders, and operators, airlines, fixed wing, <coughs> helicopter operators. Uh, in my interaction with them, Malaysian companies as well as multinationals. Uh, safety has, <clears throat> since uh, mid 2000s, has become an uh, integral part, a mandatory part in the dangerous goods regulation. But my uh, reading, speaking to the participants, those I've been consulted with, uh, they're not really too well aware of that, or it has not filtered down. I get senior people in my class, I get uh, mid level and uh, junior staff. So, <clears throat> the, I think there's uh, work to be done there. Uh, the awareness, especially on dangerous goods, uh, handling, movement, storage, the security aspect of it. And one of the components there, also in the regulation, says the uh, security awareness training is mandatory. Just like to share that, you know. And just another point on safety, uh, just an observation. Uh, we see many trucks running around, and at the back of the truck, if I drive dangerously, and there's a number there. Uh, can I just suggest, if we could put it in a more positive way, perhaps maybe say, uh, I'm a courteous driver, and then there's a phone number there. This sort of thing, it gets into the subconscious the way we address, again, talking about interaction with people. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you for those comments. Um, yeah, I think awareness is a, is a good issue. Yeah, we all are aware that um, safety and security is important, but like to Joe's point or question earlier when he asked about um, how many of us were aware of TAPA. Uh, it's been around for some time. I can't remember when it was first introduced to. Uh, but it's been around for some time. And, and yeah, it's always very interesting uh, to see how many of us are very aware of it. When you talk about uh, DG training and IATA DG training, even for air freight forwarders, uh, whilst we've got specialists within the organization that deals with it, it's also quite surprising to see that, for example, people in the sales force who are not aware of these requirements. Um, so how that's permeated within organizations, whether you're a PPL or a shipper, 
Um, it's quite interesting to see. Well, um, to wrap us up, maybe a final comment from each of the panelists, starting with you, Sach. Um, sure. Um, I'd like to touch on safety. I'd point to the thing in particular, I think, that the biggest safety risk we have in Asia is fatigue management. We have touched on that, I've touched, touched on it briefly now. Um, and I think we all, especially all of us in the logistics industry here, especially for managing uh, drivers, uh, is to manage the drivers' working hours. Uh, I think there's still legislation improvements that are needed within Malaysia. I think the legislation is not clear on working hours uh, for drivers. Uh, but I think we have a responsibility because I think the majority of the accidents generally in Asia are down to fatigue, are down to drivers working excessive hours, starting their shifts at different times every day. So we have a responsibility as a labour force and as an employer to make sure our teams are rostering well, auditing the rostering programme, and ensuring the drivers get the right amount of rest between each shift. So I think that's something I'd really like everyone to focus on, uh, because it is, I think, the biggest area of deaths on the road here in Malaysia. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, talking about security, actually, I think that's a necessity for us to sort of uh, uh, move on from the traditional security into uh, supply chain based security, introducing uh, information technology into the supply chain security, and uh, a human resources factor where policies are, policies are implemented to be blood free. And uh, the other factor is a company management impending security and in all, in all structures of his management, including partners, uh, what you call suppliers, and uh, into the management process. Thank you. Do we need to do the wrap up of safety and security? Yeah, um, but let me, let me touch on a point which is very interesting. Most of the people in this room are touching supply chain or in supply chain management. Yet, most people say, well, security is not my responsibility, safety is not my responsibility. And therefore, I, I don't take much interest unless I'm told to do it. So if someone doesn't do it, I'll do it. And I think that's a very much the problem that we are seeing today in our environment. That everyone is still thinking silo. Oh, I just take care of logistics, or take care of the warehouse, and, and someone else was telling me what's going on other things. Unfortunately, that is not sustainable. And we were talking today and yesterday about sustainability and values. But when we drill down into who is responsible for security and safety? Oh yes, it is my security director here, or my HR person there. That is the problem that we are facing as we will change. Today, in managing every part of the business, it's about stakeholder management. If I'm a supply chain manager, I have a stake in security, I have a stake in the safety, I have a stake in a number of activities which may be responsible, function responsible for somebody else, but if I have my people as, as uh, general, is Gavin here saying, I want to make sure that my warehouse operators wearing a helmet, wearing a harness, wearing whatever, when they go home, because that is an impact on me. So you're a stakeholder, and you have to drive. What I'm saying is that stakeholders need to be actively involved in solving the problem. So when we go down to the, to the, 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 sort of the brass specs, it's all about leadership and driving the value. And even if you're not responsible for security and safety, as a stakeholder, you need to also lead initiatives to make your activity holistic and overall complete. That is my summary. All right, thank you very much, Jim. Um, so with that, um, please join me in thanking the panel.